western Alaska. Just below the Arctic Circle, on the edge of the Bering Sea. A brutal and forbidding place, especially in winter. It is a very foreign world out there. Whiteouts are common on the coast. There is a whistle in the wind, even if it's not windy on the ground. In Nome, in the winter of 1925, a deadly virus threatens the region, and the city sends out a desperate cry for help. Diphtheria is such a deadly disease, it's incredibly contagious. And for the community of, of 1,500 residents, icebound and stuck within a prison of ice and snow. On this episode of When Weather Changed History, with an epidemic looming, the only hope for survival is life-saving medicine, brought in by dog sled. Battling nature, battling this incredible weather, and doing it with this ancient means of transportation. It's a race against time, across hundreds of miles in extreme conditions. This was an absolutely brutal test of how far people could go. An undertaking of this sort was just beyond imagination. It's March 17, 2007, just after sunrise in the riverfront town of Ninana, Alaska. The temperature is 33 degrees below zero, an indication of what's to come for the dog sled teams and snowmobilers who've assembled near the railroad tracks. Mushing is the common term used for driving a dog team. And these 30 adventurers are about to attempt a remarkable trek cutting a trail from Ninana across nearly 800 miles of frozen wilderness to Nome on the edge of the Bering Sea. It's called the Norman Vaughn Serum Run. The annual expedition recreates an event that took place in 1925. In the winter of that year, 20 men and their dog teams risked their lives along this very same trail. Their mission, deliver a life-saving package of diphtheria serum to Nome. Today, the journey is still a daunting test of endurance for both the animals and their mushers. 22-year-old Hannah Motoro is looking forward to it. It's a very rare opportunity to be able to cross the state of Alaska by dog team, but the thing about the serum run that drew me to it was the fact that the purpose is to retrace a historical event. Hannah and her mom, Debbie, will both be traveling by dog team. I love you. Thanks for everything. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> Hannah's father, Mark, will be on the trail to provide snowmobile support. He knows that even with modern day gear and technology, the weather along the trail can be extremely hazardous. The temperatures combined with winds, were horrendous in the original serum run. They saw 55, 60 below. But for Hannah and many of the mushers gathered here, this challenge is exceptional. I can't stop mushing until I make the trip to Nome. It's, it's so legendary. It's often said that no roads lead to Nome. To this day, there are no road systems connected to the almost barren peninsula. The isolation is made even more severe by harsh winter weather. Storms in Nome are a reality of living there. For any length of time, we're going to be faced uh, with strong winds, blowing snow, and blizzard conditions. Pioneers first settled here in the late 1800s. Nothing would have justified turning the place into a town, with one big exception. The thing that caused the founding of Nome was the only thing that could have caused it, and it was the discovery of gold at Nome. In 1898, three lucky prospectors discovered that the sandy beaches of Nome were littered with gold. There was no great excavation necessary to pull this stuff up. You simply went down to the beach, and uh, washed the gravel away and went home rich. It was the golden beaches of Nome that 
thrilled the imagination and caused a stampede of upwards of 20,000 people to descend on the shore there in the summer of 1900. Within a year, Nome became a rough and tumble town of prospectors, bankers, and brothels. Wyatt Earp, the famous gunslinger from Tombstone, Arizona, arrived and opened the Dexter Saloon. The stampede ended as suddenly as it began. By 1925, the golden days had long passed. The pattern throughout the North has been for gold to be discovered, people to rush in, try to make a killing, and most of them left just as rapidly as they arrived. In Nome, the population had plummeted from 20,000 to fewer than 1,500 souls. Even the most die-hard prospectors only came to mine the beaches in summer. They left town on the last steamer of the season. Nome's Arctic winter meant surviving months of near total darkness and drifting snow. This is an incredibly rugged, kind of individualistic, you know, tough town. If you don't cover up all the holes and crevices throughout your cabin, the snow could drift through those holes and come all the way up to the doorknob. Along Front Street, snow drifts reached the second story windows. When the Bering Sea froze, Nome was cut off from the rest of the world. It was a small American town that, in some ways, was a lot like other small American towns, except this town was on the edge of the Bering Sea and was icebound for eight months a year. The only way to get in and out was by dog team, and that would still be a 700-mile trip to the nearest railhead. December 1924. Winter is tightening its grip on Nome. That's when a number of young children begin to develop sore throats. Curtis Welch is Nome's only doctor. The Connecticut-born physician has practiced in Nome for nearly 18 years. Sore throats are a common complaint during the winter months. He had so little equipment that initially he just had to go, really go by his sight. And when he saw these swollen red throats of children, he believed these children just had severe tonsillitis. On December 28th, however, a young patient dies unexpectedly. For the next month, Dr. Welch and his nurses examine children in town and in the nearby Inuit village. He diagnoses an increasing number of patients with tonsillitis. Then, Dr. Welch is shocked when two more children die. He said, my God, you know, children shouldn't be dying of sore throats. And he realized that his diagnosis of tonsillitis was wrong. January 20th, Welch examines three-year-old Billy Barnett he discovers grayish lesions on the back of the child's throat. It's a telltale sign that the affliction is not tonsillitis, but something far more sinister, diphtheria, a disease that is often called the strangler. Diphtheria is a really deadly bacteria, and children are really the most susceptible. Ultimately, a child would suffocate to death from this toxic membrane inside the back of their throat. With three children already dead, Dr. Curtis Welch realizes his town is facing the possibility of an epidemic. Around this same time, a high-pressure system slowly moves toward the Alaskan interior. It will bring a relentless blast of sub-zero temperatures. 1925 would turn out to be one of the worst winters on record, the worst conditions that it had seen in 20 years. Dr. Welsh found himself in a terrible predicament when he realized that the sore throats that he had been seeing was the start of an epidemic of diphtheria. Coming up next on When Weather Changed History, the desperate call for help. It was so terrifying, the threat of the great child killer, the child strangler, diphtheria, wiping out these isolated populations. January 22nd, 1925, in the depths of winter, 
An ominous Morris code message goes out over the radio telegraph to the public health department in Washington, D.C. The message is from the faraway outpost of Nome, Alaska. No one had heard from Nome, Alaska in, in, in years, and yet here was this one lone telegram that alerted the world that this lonely outpost was in trouble. Dr. Curtis Welch reports that three small children have died, victims of diphtheria, a highly contagious and often deadly respiratory ailment. The doctor's small supply of antitoxin has expired. He issues an urgent plea for more of the life-saving serum. It is his only hope of averting a full-scale epidemic. Today, diphtheria is prevented with early childhood inoculations. In 1925, it could only be treated with an antitoxin. The disease could appear to strike at random, but in fact, its transfer was more insidious. A child's school book or glove can easily carry the disease from one host to another until entire families are infected. The risk to a closed community like Nome was easy to imagine. Just seven years earlier in 1918, a worldwide pandemic of Spanish influenza had spread through Europe and the US. It resulted in the deaths of more than 20 million people. Alaska had been hit hard. It was just a, a real calamity, probably the worst calamity that had ever befallen Alaska. All along the Seward Peninsula, entire villages disappeared. Now, an outbreak of diphtheria could threaten all of Northwest Alaska. Without the antitoxin, the death rate for those children infected could reach 75%. It was in the dead of winter, it was January. There were all these conditions that were working against them. Nome was surrounded by native villages that included almost 10,000 individuals. And so it wasn't just Nome that was in trouble. Dr. Curtis Welch consults with Nome's mayor and moves quickly to quarantine the community. Everyone suspected of having the disease is kept behind closed doors. Notices are posted with a warning to keep out. Radio messages are relayed to the territorial governor of Alaska and to Washington, D.C., stating an epidemic of diphtheria is now inevitable. Welch and Nome's mayor put out the call for one million units of antitoxin, enough to treat hundreds of citizens. Within days, news wires across the country pick up the story. Suddenly, people as far away as New York City are rallying to save the children of Nome, Alaska. You have all the elements that make for a good story. You have people who are in danger. You have an isolated, somewhat romantic community, Nome, Alaska. You have children. So it's kind of easy to see why this would become a worldwide sensation. It was one of those first stories that the country was able to follow as the story unfolded. January 25th, three days after the first call for help went out, a thousand miles away, the Alaskan Railroad Hospital in Anchorage locates 300,000 units of the antitoxin. It's far short of the million units requested, but enough to stave off an epidemic. The problem now is how to get the precious medicine to Nome in time. Getting there by sea is impossible. In the middle of winter, Nome is icebound. Flying the serum would be risky. Only a few bush pilots have ever flown into remote towns like Nome. There had been a number of airplanes brought up. Uh, enterprising, daredevil individuals decided they'd try it and see if they could live. Back in 1920, a US Army aircraft made a 9,000-mile flight round trip from New York to Nome and back. Most of Nome came out to view the spectacle. The way of life on the dog trails was just about to be replaced by the airplane. People could see the, the writing on the wall and the future. The dog team would not be the prime means of getting from place to place in the winter. But really, that future was not here yet. In 1925, no pilot had ever attempted a flight to Nome during Alaska's frigid winter. A prominent newspaper editor thinks it can be done. William Thompson of the Fairbanks Daily News Miner launches a campaign to fly the serum in. W.F. Thompson had become a big believer in aviation. 
and he was one of the investors in an early aviation company. Now, Thompson and some of his compatriots here determined that one way of getting this antitoxin to Nome would be by air. But Fairbanks' only two airplanes are World War I vintage biplanes. Both are open cockpit models that have already been dismantled and crated for the winter. Temperatures ranging from you know, 20 below to 60 below zero. And in the open cockpit airplanes of that day, it would have been a monumental challenge just to get it up into the air. The territorial governor, Scott Bone, knows the attempt would be risky even under perfect conditions. But in the windy, sub-zero temperatures, it could be fatal. Even if the pilots are willing to risk their lives, the governor is unwilling to risk the serum. So he orders the serum to be sent by train from Anchorage to the end of the rail line in Nenana, Alaska. From here, it will be a 700-mile mission for man and his dogs. Really, when you look at it, this was a no-brainer. Uh, while dog sleds uh, may not be high tech, it was elegant and it worked. It had been developed over thousands of years. From Ninana, dog sled teams will take the serum across the barren Alaska interior, traveling along the mail route known as the Iditarod Trail. The trip usually takes up to 25 days. Governor Bone hopes this trip can be done in much less time. He recruits the best teams around. And they were, for the most part, mail drivers. These were the most trusted kings of the trail. But these guys often would travel you know, in all sorts of temperatures and blizzards to, to, to deliver the US mail. But this journey will be far different. The winter of 1925 was just exceptionally severe. Temperatures were you know, ranging down to 60 below and colder. And there's no room for error at those temperatures. Coming up next on When Weather Changed History, a fleet of heroic dog teams sets off in a daring race against time. January 27th, 1925. A relay race is on to deliver life-saving diphtheria antitoxin across nearly 700 miles of Alaskan wilderness. A high-pressure system is moving across the interior, bringing with it a blast of Arctic cold. The 20-pound package of antitoxin arrives by train at the end of the rail line in the town of Ninana. It's handed over to the first musher to be transported to Nome. More than 80 years later, this historic event is remembered and retraced. It begins when a ceremonial package of the life-saving serum arrives in Ninana aboard the Alaska Railroad. The conductor places the package into the hands of an official who hands it off to the first musher to leave Ninana. 150 sled dogs begin the trip to Nome. From Ninana, the trail stretches across miles of frozen river and then follows the wind-battered coastline to Nome. Today, the distance is nearly 800 miles. The weather on this route can be unpredictable and deadly. Every year, the trail changes. And every year, the trail changes depending on the wind conditions and then the ice conditions. The dream weather conditions are between 10 below and 20 above. That's when the dogs run at their peak. In reality, there can be very, very extreme weather conditions out there. The temperature on this day is 33 degrees below zero. It is bitter, dangerous cold, but not as dangerous as it was in 1925, when the first dog team led by Wild Bill Shannon pulled away from the Ninana Railroad with the antitoxin. He left the Ninana station with his dogs. It was already 50 degrees below zero. This was incredibly dangerous temperatures to be driving your dog team. Even so, Wild Bill Shannon is determined to help get the serum to Nome in record-breaking time. The plan calls for Shannon to make the first leg of a relay, a 52-mile journey from Ninana to the next mail stop in Tolovana. A series of handoffs to fresh dog sled teams will allow the antitoxin to travel around the clock. Ah! 
Meantime, another team will set off from Nome to intercept the life-saving serum in the village of Nulato. This team will be headed by renowned musher, Leonard Seppala. Leonard Seppala might have been the most prominent dog musher in Alaska. He, he had come to uh, Alaska in 1900 as a, a Norwegian immigrant. His lead dog, Togo, is also famous for his leadership and ability to sense danger. Seppala and Togo will make the trip from Nome to Nulato and back again. Their 630-mile round trip is the longest and most dangerous leg of the relay. Togo and Seppala had previously made this same run in a record-setting four days. But there is danger every step of the way, and this time, hundreds of lives are at stake. Coming up on When Weather Changed History, mushers face their first obstacle, 30 miles of frozen river, which can harbor a nearly undetectable danger known as drum ice. You might have a chasm of 12 feet or 15 feet in depth, like a, a crystalline tomb, and a dog driver or his entire team can fall through a very wide opening in the ice. It's February 18th, 2007, day one, on the trail for a group of dog mushers who are retracing the steps of the original diphtheria serum run that took place in 1925. The first leg of this journey is to cross 30 miles of the frozen Tanana River. River travel is both beautiful and dangerous. The frozen surface of a river can hide the ever-changing flow of water below. One danger is a phenomenon called drum ice. Drum ice occurs when the water beneath the surface of a frozen river recedes. Cold air seeps through the surface cracks in the ice and causes the lower water level to freeze, creating a cavern of ice. You might have 18 feet of uh, ice on a river, but if you um, come across an open cavern where the ice has worn away in the center, it creates almost like a huge drum. This drum can be up to 15 feet deep. A musher and his entire team can fall into it and be trapped. If the weather warms slightly, the river can pose yet another kind of threat. If there is overflow, which is water on top of ice, um, you know, you can end up getting wet. The dogs don't love getting wet either, and so this is something else that dogs need to know is how to lead you through water and through overflow. On the trail, the sled dogs become partners in a test of survival. Mushers rely on their dogs' keen senses. It's a tricky topic to explain to somebody, this incredible respect we have for the dogs, the rapport we have with the dogs, but it's like any other partnership. You go through great times and more challenging times together, and you somehow have to communicate really effectively to do it together. After traveling six hours on the frozen river, the modern-day mushers arrive at the native village of Old Minto. Their first order of business is to tend to the dogs. They'll run for 50 miles, and the first thing you do when you get to a checkpoint is provide for them. So you want to get their beds of straw ready for them to sleep. You want to cook up a hot meal for them to eat. I mean, the rule with mushing is always the dogs come first. Every night along the trail to Nome, they'll stop in small villages like this one, taking a total of 19 days to complete the journey that the original serum mushers hoped to do in just five. Weather was the big thing for the 1925 serum run because it was so bad and they knew that they had to get it there as fast as possible. And I can only imagine what it would be like to do that knowing that you carried something that would save so many lives. January 28, 1925. The situation in Nome has become a crisis. Dr. Curtis Welch and his nurses are forced to ration their meager supply of antitoxin among a growing number of patients. 650 miles away, the serum arrives in the village of Minto. Musher Wild Bill Shannon has traveled hours on the surface of the frozen river. 
rivers have a couple of disadvantages. The minus on the river is that it's a little cooler than up on the river bank because cold air sinks. Shannon had left Ninana with a nine dog team. Now as he arrives at a roadhouse, three of his dogs are too sick to continue. The dogs have run too hard and their lungs are scorched from the cold air. The sub-zero temperature also means that liquid antitoxin could freeze within minutes. As a safety precaution, the 20-pound bundle of serum has been carefully insulated. Shannon takes time to rest and warm the serum. Then he sets out with his remaining team, leaving his injured dogs to be cared for at the roadhouse. Shannon travels another 22 miles to the Tolovana Roadhouse before handing the serum to a second musher. The temperature is 56 degrees below zero, but with the threat of an epidemic growing by the hour, the relay presses on. The dog teams are fighting day and night, pushing forward with every minute closer to Nome. They had at some point in each leg had to stop and rest and warm up the serum next to the light of a fire. The following afternoon, the serum arrives at Manly Hot Springs. The relay has been in progress less than 24 hours, and the weather is already proving hazardous. Meanwhile, 400 frozen miles away, musher Leonard Seppala has left Nome to intercept the serum. He's racing toward the most dangerous leg of the relay yet, the Alaskan coast. In truth, uh, traveling in the interior was easier than traveling on the coast, but not for some of the reasons one might first think. Temperatures in the interior are considerably colder than they are in the coast. What the coast has is the everlasting problem of wind. Seppala travels from Nome along a trail that skirts most of the exposed coastline. But then, he will take a shortcut right across the frozen water of Norton Sound. Experienced dog teams like Seppala's often take this dangerous shortcut across the ocean ice. There are good things and there are bad things about being out on the ice, and they're intuitive. Ocean ice uh, is very dynamic, and it just doesn't sit still. Open channels of water can suddenly appear. Strong offshore winds can cause the ice to break up and drift out to sea without warning. Given the many dangers, Seppala is still the best, most experienced man to make this trip across Norton Sound and back again. During his life, it's said that he covered a quarter million miles by dog team. In one winter alone, he went 7,000 miles. January 30th, Nome. There are more than 20 confirmed cases of diphtheria. Dr. Welch's supply of antitoxin is dwindling. A reporter living in Nome writes, all hope is in the dogs and their heroic drivers. Nome appears to be a deserted city. More than 500 miles away in Fairbanks, Publisher W.F. Thompson demands that aircraft take over and deliver an additional supply of serum from the lower 48. But Governor Scott Bone still rejects the plan. Bone had a more realistic view of the situation. I mean, this weather and the mechanical nightmares that were just waiting to happen with sending an airplane out into a severe cold snap. Instead, Bone decides to speed up the dog sled relay. He decides that musher Leonard Seppala should still cover the most dangerous leg, cutting across Norton Sound. But his trip will be shortened. He will be intercepted earlier than planned by adding more drivers to the relay. Once the epidemic started raging, they realized that they had to increase the speed that the serum was going to be delivered to Nome, so they had to add a number of extra relays. Except there's no way to tell Seppala that the relay has changed. Telephone and telegraph systems bypass the small coastal villages. Hour after hour, day and night, dog sled teams carry the serum across the frozen territory towards Seppala. They took extraordinary chances for themselves. Most of the time, they wouldn't have maybe pushed when they pushed, they would have waited for morning, you know, or something else. But they saw the need 
January 31st. On day four of the relay, near the town of Shaktulik, the precious serum is passed to one of the mushers, Henry Ivanov, who is added to the relay to speed it up. In Nome, reports of the serum's progress are continually forwarded to Dr. Curtis Welch. Recent weather bulletins say the weather is warming along the trail for the first time in two weeks. Dr. Welch hopes the serum will arrive the next day. But just as temperatures shift in the interior, a powerful snowstorm moves toward the coast. By now, musher Leonard Seppala and his team with his lead dog Togo have traveled 170 miles from Nome. Coming up on When Weather Changed History, Seppala prepares to make the treacherous passage across Norton Sound. He and Togo will face gale force winds and shifting sea ice. January 31st, 1925, Nome, Alaska. Residents of the ice-bound city wait for a supply of antitoxin to stave off a deadly epidemic. Their desperation grows as a powerful blizzard bears down on the region. The weather charts for the early morning hours then uh, showed a rapidly intensified storm. The race to get the antitoxin to Nome has lasted five days and covered over 400 miles. Now dog teams are headed toward the coast and into the thick of the storm. On March 7, 2007, dog teams traveling toward the coast face similar brutal conditions. On this day of the annual serum run to Nome, the temperature is nearly 15 below zero. Winds gust to 40 miles an hour, and on the trail, mushers are nearly stopped in their tracks by blizzard conditions. Musher Hannah Motoro pulls her team in for the night. She's impressed by how well her dogs have pulled through. There were pretty high winds and um, a lot of glare ice that we were running on, so it was pretty intense mushing. And the dogs did amazing. I think there were a lot more frostbitten humans than anything else. The mushers on the serum run have had extreme weather. Temperatures in the interior reached 50 below zero, and they've shipped 20 dogs home from the trail. Hannah and Debbie have dropped two of their pups. We sent a couple of them home yesterday by airplane, but the beauty of this trip is that you can send them home from checkpoints, um, but the team is still going strong. The trail boss, Kent Kantowski, isn't taking chances. He decides the runners will hold over in White Mountain and wait for better conditions. Winds as high as 97 miles an hour are being recorded. There's no way that it's worth risking, you know, dogs or people in those kind of temperatures. Those, those are the kind of conditions people die in. Eight decades ago, waiting out a storm just as bad was a luxury the original serum runners couldn't afford. In 1925, near the village of Shaktulik, Musher Henry Ivanov is carrying the serum toward Leonard Seppla and his lead dog, Togo. Thirty miles to the north, Seppala is committed to crossing Norton Sound before the storm hits. He knew that he was taking a very big risk. Not only was the wind increasing, but it was offshore. And he could expect with almost certainty that the ice would break away. All you can do is make your best guess and go with it. And if, it's, if you make your guess wrong, you're going to die. So far, they've been lucky navigating the wind and the ice. But Seppala does not know that his leg of the relay has been shortened. He still believes he has 100 miles to go to pick up the package of serum in Nulato. Meantime, just outside the village of Shaktulik, musher Henry Ivanov stops to untangle the lines on his dog team. In the distance, he sees Leonard Seppala approaching from Nome. 
Ivanov flags Sepala down. He hands off the serum package and tells Sepala about the changes in the relay. Sepala's round trip has been shortened by 300 miles. Now he has to turn around immediately and carry the serum back across the exposed ice towards Nome. We had a developing northeast gale. Uh, every conceivable factor uh, was in place to create great danger for traveling on the ice. It's growing dark. On Norton Sound, gale force winds carry an estimated wind chill factor of 85 degrees below zero, making the conditions even more risky for Sepala's team. You never ask a dog team to do something they can't do, but you have to instill in your dog's confidence, and it's a very tricky business. It will be up to Sepala's lead dog, Togo, to lead the team across the ice and through the dark. You have to kind of surrender the team to the lead dog, and you just have to trust them, because they're going to be able to find the trail you can't see. At 8 p.m., Seppel arrives in Isaac's Point. With Togo in the lead, the team has made it across the shifting ice. At Isaac's Point, they rest until 2 a.m., then continue on through gale force winds. February 1st, 78 miles outside the city of Nome. Seppala finally passes the serum to relay musher Charlie Olson, who will carry it the next 25 miles. By now, the reported number of diphtheria cases in Nome has reached 28. The package of antitoxin on its way will be just enough to stave off an epidemic. But Dr. Curtis Welch faces a painful dilemma. He would confer with his wife how horrifying it was just to be the only doctor in, in such a large area. And he just couldn't find another colleague just to talk to or to share his suspicions or his doubts with. Welch believes a delay is better than the risk of losing the serum. He and the mayor of Nome decide to call a stop to the relay until the storm passes. But there are a few telephones along the mail route, and no way to tell all the mushers about the decision. So the relay moves forward anyway. Musher Charlie Olson makes his way through the drifting snow. He stops only once to blanket his dogs to protect them from frostbite. Fifty-three miles away from Nome, Olsen passes the serum to a friend and co-worker of Leonard Seppala, a fellow Norwegian named Gunnar Kosen. Gunnar Kassen had uh, the second-string team of dogs that Leonard Seppala had prepared for him in case Nome needed another dog team. As the epidemic grew, Kosen was added to the relay at the last minute. Kosen chooses a feisty but inexperienced Siberian husky named Balto to lead his team. Balto was considered a second string dog. He was a workhorse, you know, he just was kind of not even considered a lead dog. Gunnar Kosen is confident that Balto is the right dog for the challenge. Throughout the evening, Kosen had hoped the storm would pass. Now, he's certain that a dangerous blizzard is developing. The great devil in the Alaskan weather scene isn't so much the cold. You can protect yourself against 60 below zero. What you cannot protect yourself against is the wind. Just when you think they can't have anything worse hurled at them, it actually gets really bad. Coming up next, in the conclusion of When Weather Changed History, Gunnar Kossen and his lead dog, Balto, will face a raging blizzard in the final push to Nome. February 1st, 1925. Musher Gunnar Kosen and his feisty Siberian Husky Balto are in the final leg in the race to Nome. They travel through the night, breaking through trails that are now covered in snow. The winds are fierce, and visibility is so poor that Kosen can barely see the team. In a ground blizzard, the only focus you can have for that entire period of time is those dogs because they're the only thing that's gonna get you to Nome. From Nome, Dr. Curtis Welch has put out the word to halt the delivery of antitoxin, fearing the shipment would be lost in the blizzard. 
But Gunnar Kosen never gets the message. He and his dog team reach the next roadhouse at 3 a.m., ahead of schedule. Balto and the other dogs are moving well, so Kosen presses forward. They cross the remaining 25 miles under clearing skies. At 5.30 a.m., they finally arrive at the sleeping town of Nome. Not a single vial of the life-saving serum is broken. By noon, the antitoxin is thawed and ready to use. Gunnar Kosen's dog, Balto, will become one of the most famous dogs in history. Balto is a leader that finished the serum run into Nome in lead. So he's gotten a lot of the attention and surely was an amazing dog. Sort of the unsung hero of the serum run was Togo, who is Sepala's lead dog. It's believed that more than 20 men and 150 dogs participated in the race to Nome. Together, the teams covered the 674 miles in five and a half days, breaking a world record. Five of Nome's children died from diphtheria in the winter of 1925, but without the serum brought by dog sled, thousands more might have died. The lives that were at stake were native children primarily. It was the Eskimos that could not survive white man's diseases. They had no immunity against any of the diseases, especially diphtheria. On March 12, 2007, after 22 days on the trail, the annual serum runners arrived safely in Nome, successfully retracing the trail that had been blazed more than eight decades earlier. Their test of endurance is a tribute to all the mushers and dogs that were willing to risk their lives in an historic mission to prevent an epidemic. The beautiful thing that happened in 1925 was this, this kind of mixed, coexisting culture of Nome um, had all pulled together. And it was really the dependence on the native methods uh, that pulled the whole town through. The serum run was really, in a way, the epitome of the, the heroic, the sacrificing pioneer um, using this primitive, primitive means of transportation to save the children of Nome.